ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to One on One with Wayne Eckerson. This is part of the BI Leadership webcast series. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's event in which we are going to talk to one of the real thought leaders in the whole world of information management. We're very pleased to have, let's face it, a titan of the new digital generation. Facebook is on the line today. And we're going to be talking all about how you measure impacts, not just insights. So obviously, in the whole world of analytics, we talk about how you can identify good information sources, manage data, harness data, manipulate data, do some analytics. There are tons of tools out there available for companies who want to make use of all this information. And let's face it, there are quite a few companies that have just driven right out of this whole data-driven mindset and are information companies, really. They leverage information. They use information. Their assets really boil down to data. So we're going to learn from uh, Ken Rudin. He's Director of Analytics at Facebook. And of course, our good friend Wayne Eckerson, founder of the BI Leadership Forum. Today's event is sponsored by Tableau Software. Very big thank you to those folks for helping us bring you this content free of charge. You can see they have a customer conference coming up November 5th to the 8th. And I found out that Malcolm Gladwell is going to be the keynote speaker, so I guarantee that is going to be interesting stuff. So here's just a slide about the, the title, Measuring Impacts, Not Insight. So obviously getting insights is key, but the last mile really is that action which is taken upon getting the insight. So all the insights in the world don't do a whole lot of good unless you can change some business process or change some metric or do something that impacts the processes, and ultimately the bottom line of the business. So Wayne, as many of you know, he is a BI thought leader. He used to work at CDWI. That's where I met Wayne. Uh, he was there for quite a long time, honestly. He and I worked together for several years. Uh, he's currently the director of research at Tech Target and the founder of this leadership forum, which really was designed to find out how business leaders are working with these different tools and disciplines and methodologies to better understand their business, to better understand their competitive landscape, and to come up with ideas and insights about how to use information in order to drive business value. So as you can imagine, there's just a whole world of different topics and subtopics that we can explore in this series, but we try to focus on the management side of the process. How do BI directors and VPs and other senior executives work with their teams and help them figure out not just which tools to use, but which methods to apply and, and how to view the whole world of managing information assets. Because really, if you are one of these data-driven companies these days, you need to embrace insight and action as one loop, essentially. And you need to really focus on making sure that your culture is one of awareness around the value of information assets. And there are lots of ways you can do that. And uh, we've already explored some of those in our past sh show in this series, and we'll have another one coming up as well. So Wayne's book is, I'm told it's available right now. You can go to Amazon.com and order Secrets of Analytical Leaders. This is not the first book that uh, Wayne has written, but as you know, I am sure it takes a tremendous amount of work to put something like that together. So hop online and check that out. So the BI Leadership Forum, it is a research and education service geared to these analytical directors and their teams. You can find more information about that right there and on Twitter as well. You'll find yours truly on Twitter at Eric underscore Kavanaugh.com. You'll see me tweeting throughout the show today. And feel free to tweet as well. Just kind of mention me and we'll get your question into the uh, into the queue here. All right, so here's a slide about Ken Rudin, Director of Analytics at Facebook. As you can see, he's had an esteemed career already, VP of Analytics at Zynga, founder at Lucidera. I remember those guys, VP and GM at uh, Siebel CRM. So you can see he has a lot of experience, and he's kind of brought all of that to bear moving over to Facebook. So at this point, I'm going to push Wayne's first slide, and Wayne, I'm going to hand the WebEx keys over to you. And here you go. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the show today. Uh, we're very privileged to have Ken Rudin. Uh, Ken and I go way back. Um, I've known him ever since he uh, founded Emergent. Uh, what was the last name of that? Emergent Consulting, right? Yeah, Emergent uh, Consulting, yeah. We just called it Emergent. Yeah. 
Emergent, right. Okay, so I was right. Uh, focused on parallel processing for data warehousing. Uh, and followed him through his career at uh, Siebel and, and then Lucidera and, and Zynga. And Ken is uh, one of the seven people I profiled in my book that is available today for the first time uh, on Amazon. We'll be shipping the hard copy, um, uh, actually be selling the hard copy at the TDWI show next week in Boston. So Ken, one of the things that I loved uh, about interviewing you for the book was uh, you had all these pet mantras um, that kind of summarized a whole bunch of your leadership uh, themes and techniques. And, and, and one of them uh, was uh, focus on impacts, uh, not insights. Uh, and I was wondering if you could explain to the audience exactly what you mean by that phrase, focus on impacts, not insights. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that um, I really try and infuse in any of the analysts on any of my teams in, in any places I've worked, where if I look back, uh, there is kind of three different levels of how effective you can be as an analytics organization. And the lowest level is providing reporting and dashboard capabilities, where we're telling people what kind of things have happened so they can monitor the business. But I think a long time ago, people realized that, okay, that's not really going to add a ton of uh, value to the company. What we really need to do and uh, what we really need to be focusing on is actionable insights. So there was and still is, it's the most common thing I hear today, is we've got to come up with actionable insights. Um, and for many years myself, I was focusing on that about working with teams of analysts about let's figure out how we can improve the organization, not just tell the organization where they are, but let's focus on things that if you did X, Y, and Z, based on our analyses, we think these three areas would improve in the business, and then we can present that to them, and that's the end of it. Um, the problem with that is I realized about five years ago, the biggest frustration that I had as an analyst, and most of the analysts I work with, if I were to ask them, is that they do all these great analyses and they never really get acted on. Um, you create these great presentations and you'll send them out to somebody and you'll check six months later and nothing has really changed. So I kind of came to realize that um, the, the real value that you're adding in those scenarios is about zero. If you come up with brilliant analyses and you've documented it well, you've shown all the data, but nothing actually changes inside or outside the company, then what I started doing is telling my analysts, if that's the scenario we're in, we have added no value and the company would have been better off not even paying our salaries. We did a lot of analysis, came up with insights, they were actionable, but nobody actually acted on them. So nothing, it was as if we weren't there. And the only conclusion that I could come up with about what to do about that is we have to start being focused on the impact itself. So we, it's not good enough for us to say we're going to come up with three different ways to improve margins by 2% or 5% or whatever number is relevant. Or we're going to get registrations to increase by 10% by the end of the second half. Um, it's not good enough to just say that's going to be it. We're going to figure out ways to do it we actually ha have to focus on the impact itself by saying it's not that we're coming up with insights on how to improve registrations. We have to improve registrations. It's not about coming up with insights on how to improve margins. We have to make sure those margins are actually improved. So as we'll talk about a little bit later, it actually changes the skill set of analysts I look for now. And as a quick preview of what we'll talk about a little more in depth later, they have to have business skills in addition to analytic skills. Um, they have to understand what the issues are that the organization is facing. They've got to figure out what analyses am I trying to focus on that I think are most likely to be acted on by the organization. Um, and then they have to be able to essentially market and sell their ideas so somebody acts on it. So you have to be a bit of, a, of an evangelist, which we also talk about a little bit later. Um, but so, so the, Ken, the real, you came to this realization, I know, at, at Zynga, and you, you right. kind of uh, relayed this to your team there and said that now instead of being accountable for generating wonderful insights that the business should adopt, <laughs> now they were being held accountable for the actual uh, actions um, that the business The actual adopt. result. That's the right. The actual result, so that their KPIs were the same as the business KPIs in terms of That's exactly right. And the bonus. Yep. So how did that go? How did that go over? 
and and how did you um yeah how did that go over when you presented this to them that their <laughs> their bonuses now were based on the actions not the insights well, that's by the way, that's exactly what we did, which is we set uh, people's bonuses based on the impact itself. So you would sign up at the beginning of the quarter to do something like increase margins or increase registrations or whatever it is. And I honestly don't really care how sophisticated the analysis is to figure out how to get that done. It can be something simple, but then you've got to work with the organization to make it happen. Um, and that means there's a lot of follow-up. It's not just doing analysis. A lot of it is following up with them, making sure they understand what to do and how to do it and making sure it's getting done. And I would say about 80% of the analysts thought this was an opportunity that, that they were excited about trying with a little bit of nervousness about could they actually do it. And the other 20% uh, thought that this is not what an analyst should be doing. Analysts analyze and they they don't have any control over the actual organization, so how can they possibly be held accountable uh, for that? And it's not fair that their bonus is tied to something that they don't have full control over. Um, and my response to that was that that almost sounded like a sales rep saying, look, I, I'm responsible for going and talking to customers and getting them interested in the product, but I can't force them to buy. So just because I didn't make my quota, you can't hold me responsible for that. I can't make them buy. And um, so it doesn't really matter that I didn't hit my quota. I did all the right things leading up to that. And if they chose not to buy, that's really not my fault. So I really felt that it was an analogy uh, that, that works pretty well for me, saying, look, you know, you've got to figure out not just what the analysis is, but you've got to fig figure out how to make them buy that analysis. And part of how to make them buy the analysis, which is acting on it, is figuring out what they're going to want in the first place. So how do some sales reps hit their numbers every quarter and others don't? They figure out how the products that they've got, which ones are going to be most interesting to a particular customer. They talk to the right customers, not just any customer that's got some free time on their hands. We had to do the same thing. At the end of the day, by the way, essentially that 20% ended up moving on. Uh, some we kind of helped move on, but the rest of them just decided it wasn't for them. And I think that was a very good outcome for us. That was a huge turning point for us as an organization. And we've done the same thing here at Facebook. Uh, where you're held accountable for the impact. And uh, for those who like that, it, and it's not for everybody, for those who like that, the, the outcome and the, the impact of the organization goes up dramatically. Because now you can point to it and say, we, here's three metrics that we changed, here's four behaviors that we changed. If at the end of the quarter you say, I did brilliant analyses that, you know, I came up with brilliant answers to questions no one cared about, uh, then you've wasted your time. So I think it's actually pretty liberating for the vast majority of analysts that they can now actually see an effect, an outcome, a change behavior, a moved metric, whatever it is, of the work that they're doing. So, so they can see how they actually contribute to the betterment of the organization because they can say, oh, I helped move that needle. <laughs> That's so right. they're more engaged in, in the process. But you are asking more of them, obviously. They just can't have good analytical skills. You're actually treating them as much as a salesperson, as an analyst, right? That's right. And I'm, I'm asking more of them in some areas and less of, less of them in other areas. Um, the less means I won't measure them on the sophistication of their analyses in particular. Again, if they can come up with a very simple insight that doesn't take sophisticated, complicated algorithms and so on, but it moves the needle 15% somewhere, that's brilliant. That's what we want. So I don't require that they have, uh, that they know every analytic algorithm and that uh, they do incredibly brilliant and uh, very, very sophisticated analysis. I, w I want them to focus on whatever analysis is required to make something happen. So I'm asking, uh, uh, I'm less less of a focus on the brilliance of your analysis and more of a focus on whatever the level of analysis is, can you get somebody to act on it? And it's not purely uh, just being able to sell someone and convince them. I'd say 50% of the battle starts before you even, or 50% of the battle can be won or lost before you even do the analysis, which is, do you understand what's important to these guys so that you can focus on analyzing things you know that they will act on? If I'm in All a, right, let's, I'm go, a let's go to the next question here because I think that sure. gets right into the heart of what you're uh, talking sure. about now. And that, so the next question uh, is uh, uh, your, your second mantra that we talked about in the book was focus on the right questions. 
um, focus on the questions, not the answers. Uh, so right. what, what do you mean by that? Um, I think a lot of analysts I'd worked with, we always felt that the value we added was if somebody has questions, uh, we could get them the answers to those questions very quickly. And I think there is certainly value in doing that, um, uh, where you've got somebody coming to you and you treat your, you think of yourself as uh, a, a, someone who can provide answers very quickly. The challenge with that, though, is you, you position yourself as a service provider um, versus a real motivator and innovator within the company. Uh, so the, the notion is, you know, I don't want us to be like the cable guys or the appliance service guys who sit around and wait for somebody to ask a question or request some form of service, and then you quickly do a great job, um, but then you go back to, okay, now let me wait for the next thing. That's a completely reactive scenario. And I think a lot of organizations that I've joined uh, have been in that very reactive phase. And if you look at a lot of the goals that they had set for themselves, it was things like answer 90% of all questions within 48 hours, um, which is a very service-oriented metric. And again, I want people to focus on uh, the impact. So the the ability to answer questions I don't think is the real value of what analysts uh, can add. I think it's the ability to define what questions should be asked in the first place. And, and also from another perspective why I think that's true is answering questions isn't as hard today as it used to be 10 years ago. There's so much technology out there, so many tools, it makes it much easier to answer questions and also in and of itself raises a new problem that because it's so easy to answer questions, uh, people can get lost in answering question after question or asking question after question after question without taking a step back and saying, uh, you know, of the infinite number of questions I could theoretically ask of all this data I've got, which are the ones that are the most important? So this is where analysts get to be proactive. Rather than uh, getting in the frustrating situation that I saw early days at Zynga where we would sit in our suite and we had these uh, product managers coming to us saying, I need answers to these three questions and we would provide them. Um, when, it, when we took a step back, we would look at some frustrations that we had with that, which is about half the time we couldn't even tell what they were going to be using that data for. And when we'd ask them, they weren't sure either. It was just, well, somebody wants this data. So we're not sure what anyone was going to do with it. So that was part of the frustration. But an even bigger part was we knew that there were things that they should be looking at that they were never asking us about. You're asking about how many new users are signing up for the service, but you're really very rarely asking any questions for the churn of your existing users. You're so focused on getting new users. Well, if you look at the numbers, the big challenge you've got right now is your churn is growing faster than the rate of new users is coming in. So we really need to be having people focus on churn and what we back then called the, the growth accounting model, which is you've got people coming in and people going out and uh, people who were dormant coming back to life. All of that is, think of it in you know financial accounting, you've got revenues and expenses. Where do you net out at the end of the day? That's what you really need to be focusing on, not just how many registrations did we get, where are they coming from? So it requires a skill that's much more focused on business than just pure analytics. Because uh, again, the if I come up with the right questions, there's tons of people out there who can come up with the answer. What differentiates me as an organization is, are we focusing on the right things? And Wayne, if you'd like, I can come up with the example about uh, friends or discuss the example about friends uh, at Zynga. Oh, I, was and, just about and, to, uh, I was just about to ask you because that was a great yeah. example of Zynga. Yeah, you, you, you and I have spoken, spoken about that one, so I'll, I'll share that one, which I think one of the most uh, – Poignant examples that I remember uh, in recent years is when I was at Zynga, everyone was focused on how many friends do you have playing a particular game with you. Zynga is an online games provider, predominantly on, on Facebook, and take a game like Farmville, one of their classics, you have these neighbors, which are your friends who you're playing with. And we were focused all the time on how many friends do people have, and how do we get more friends, and what is effective in helping people and encouraging people to get more and more and more friends because the fundamental assumption was more friends equals more fun. If you've got more friends, you're clearly going to want to play more often because all your friends are there. Um, and so everything we did was focused on getting people to 
get more of their friends, connect with more of their friends in the game. Um, and so many of the reports and, and, and analyses we were doing were all focused on answering questions about how many friends you have, where are they coming from? We de decided to take a step back and say, wait a minute, have we ever done an analysis that saw if there's any correlation between a user's engagement with the game or retention in the game and the number of friends they have? And when we started looking at that, uh, we got a, quite a shocking res result, which was there didn't seem to be any correlation between the number of friends that you had agreed to play the game with and how likely you were to continue playing that game. So that was a little bit of a shocker because the fundamental premise of Zynga is, you know, it, these are social games and social adds a new element which is really valuable for people. But it looked like we just stumbled across a really important question that, hmm, if I count the number of friends you've got playing Farmville with you, um, it doesn't seem to be any correlation to your likelihood to keep playing. So we took a step back and we said, what does it correlate with? And, or what correlates with engagement if it's not your friend count? And we thought about it. We did a lot of analysis. We read some papers that we found online. In fact, one paper from Facebook was very helpful about friending and different levels of friends. And then we came up with this concept of, hmm, there's a difference between people you've decided to play the game with and people you are, in fact, actually actively playing with. I may have said to 40 people, sure, you know, let's, let's be neighbors, but I only interact with five of them. So we came up with this concept of, active social network versus just the overall social network. So how much of it are you actively playing with? And what we found was that was massively correlated to how likely you were to keep playing the game. So the impact there was we went from trying to get you, if you had 30 friends in the game, rather than trying to get you to get to 35 or 40 friends, switched everything we did, it, the total behaviors within the company and the things we would measure changed along with it. But if you had 30 friends in the game, now the focus was not to get you to 35, but to get you to interact with five of them every week. And a whole new set of questions we asked about that. So I really felt that was a great case of us focusing on the right question versus previously we just focused on answers that other people gave us. And it really redefined how we thought about things at Zynga. Yeah, I love that example uh, because so many businesses have these uh, underlying, often unconscious assumptions that drive the way they go to business, that never get challenged, never get surfaced. And so when I heard this story, you know, that the correlation was not with the number of neighbors, but the degree of engagement someone had with their neighbors, it's like, wow, this is a whole new role for analytics. Let us use analytics to surface the hidden assumptions that people have about what drives their business, and then test them, you know. Uh, yep bring out data and test those assumptions and see if they're valid or not. Because if they're not valid, you are, you are likely to be throwing millions of dollars into campaigns that are they're not going to move the needle at all. And this was so an example was of where, yeah, this is totally an example of where uh, it really had a huge impact. And analytics was driving product strategy, um, if, you know, from that perspective of what we really needed to focus on doing well within the games. Well, let's move on to our next question here, and you, you kind of touched on this already, but uh, uh, another mantra that you have is be an evangelist, not an oracle. I think this kind of sums up a lot of the, the, the statements you've made and examples you've given already, but what exactly do you mean by that, be an evangelist, not an oracle? The, the oracle, and I'm not referring to the database uh, company here, but the, the oracle, the classic dictionary definition, is someone who answers questions. and um, I think it's it's hard to get inspired, at least for me anyway, as someone whose job is to be an oracle, to just know a lot um, and answer questions all day long. And what I really want people to do is figure out new innovative ways we can and should be using data to help drive the business. So um, at Zynga, we were figuring out new ways, we could, things we could do with the data that we weren't doing before. Um, and here's a great example where it wasn't just we – we got, in fact, fairly far afield from what people would traditionally call an analyst. Um, one of the things we did was realize there's a lot of value in this data now that we're not tapping as well as we could. We know the history uh, of every game you've played and how you've played them and how frequently you've played and so on. We know your playing style. What if we were to come up with – 
a profile, kind of a, a player profile for each player that we just define internally uh, that sums up your playing style, what type of genres of games you like, the people you, you do have a, a clique of people that you normally play with. Do you play seven days a week? Or are you a guy who's a weekend warrior who only plays on weekends? Whatever it may be, we came up with about uh, half a dozen to a dozen different profiles. And then we went to the game studios, and uh, which are the divisions that actually went and created each game, and said, we have these new data sets. We feel that if you use these data sets, and here's our evidence that we've done some research on this, um, if you use this data to actually modify gameplay on the fly, so when I log in, I get a different experience than you might, Wayne, because I'm a guy who plays every day, you may focus on different, highlighting different features of the game than someone who plays once a week. Even little things like um, I'll get the daily special, whereas if you come uh, only once a week and you tend not to interact with these daily specials, don't put all these daily specials in your way. Just let you get right into the game. So depending on your profile, how you enter the game, what you do in the game, the types of quests that we may have assigned for you to work on in the game may be different. You know, we had a game Mafia Wars where it was uh, uh, about doing battle and creating the strongest mafia, and there were two different things you could do. You could either actually fight other mafia, or you could do jobs like rob banks and so on. So there were jobs and there were fights. We would look at, were you a guy who liked jobs, or were you a guy who liked fights? And we would give you more of the one you liked. So it became personalizing, using the traditional concept of personalizing, we would apply that to games with the data we had. So it was the analytics team that kind of came up with that idea brought it to the studios, said, here's what we think will happen to engagement based on these analyses we've done to engagement if you start personalizing it instead of treating everybody the same. And that was a multi-quarter project to get that done. And it was real evangelism. It's kind of like if you're starting up a company, if you've ever been through that process, and you have to evangelize your product to the first customers because you don't have any proof yet. We had a little bit of evidence, but no real proof. We had to sell some of these game studios on these, this idea, get them to implement it, work with them to make sure it worked right, and then we could take the results and said, look how well it worked, and bring it to all the other game studios and say, you guys need to do the same thing. So I think that's a great example of going well beyond the guy who just answers questions. We had an idea of what we could do based on the data, created profiles based on the data, and then went out and tried to sell, and in this case we were effective, uh, the different divisions on how they should be using it. It was, it was an idea that was generated from the analytics team, not from the other divisions themselves. So, so these analysts in your world are very proactive. They're, as you say, they're, they're evangelists. They're right. out there I, I trying them, to shape. Yeah, I mean, the term I use is the analyst evangelist. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so, it's very, so we're talking about people who really can change the, the conversation in the business really can start to change the culture and, 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 the, and the assumptions uh, about how the business should do business. Right. So to, to create that kind of impact on the business, um, how, we talked a little bit about the type of analyst that you would hire, uh, right. and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but how do you yeah. organize them for impact? Right. I think the, the last key element here was the, the – First, you want to focus on aligning everyone so that they are measured on the impact. And again, the impact is measured as either a change in behavior or a change in a metric. Um, and the second part is make sure that you are taking time to focus on what questions do we need to be asking, not just uh, providing answers. The third part is how you organize it. Um, it becomes, uh, you know, every, every quarter we'd look back at how did we do and what were the challenges we were up against. And it became apparent that trying to evangelize these things was made harder because we were outsiders. We were a separate organization trying to work with this other organization. Um, and we had good working relationships with them, but still we were not really part of their team. And it almost felt like we were trying to mandate something on them, which we didn't really even have an ability to mandate, but it felt like an external influence trying to change your behavior. So we decided we were gonna try an experiment this is years ago already, and it, it worked very well, and we're now, again, doing the same thing here at Facebook because it worked so well before, and it's working well here, too. Uh, instead of having all the analysts, we had several dozen analysts. They were all in one suite uh, on one of the floors. All but about three of them uh, moved into the physical spaces where the uh, different divisions that they were supporting 
worked. So rather than having a pool of analysts that was kind of amorphous, everyone became assigned to a particular division. You were assigned to this particular game, or at Facebook, you're assigned to this particular part of our product, uh, or you're assigned to finance, or you're assigned to whatever it is. You're going to go sit with that team. Uh, and we worked with those teams to create desks, so they sat in the thick of it. And they are invited to every meeting, just like the product managers and the engineers and the marketers, and they're part of that now. So now they don't come from the outside with this seemingly crazy idea. As the team is coming up with, what are we going to do this quarter? What are our goals? They're at the table saying, here's a couple ideas I'd like to put on the table for us to discuss. And they become an implicit part of that organization. And uh, we even experimented, and it turned out to be pretty successful uh, at Zynga. We haven't done it yet here at Facebook, of taking a further step and saying that um, that person is actually going to be moved to the budget of the organization they support. So my budget essentially went down to pretty close to zero because all the other organizations were now funding this. And uh, there were strong reasons for doing that. One is we wanted to take them, uh, wanted to make sure that, that these guys' voices were taken very seriously. Well, if you're paying for the guy, you're going to listen to him more than if he's just a freebie that some other org is paying for. So that was the reason we decided to try it, and it worked pretty well. Then we get into issues of what if the guy still reports to me? So what if I want them to do something, uh, but the finance team says, I know you want them to do something, but we're paying for them, and we want them to do something else. And those are tensions that I don't yet have a good answer to, uh, but these are things as we evolve, uh, how we're trying to figure this out. But fundamentally, the embedded analyst model is something I'm – completely sold on, and I talk to any organization I can about, you really need to do this. They have to be part of the team. They can roll up to a central organization, and they should do that, so you get some momentum uh, company-wide in one group versus having it be too diffuse if everybody just dissipated to their own groups. Uh, but they are plugged into and see and they see what's going on day to day and they understand the opportunities and the challenges of that area of their business and then they can figure out what to analyze that's going to be most aligned with those opportunities and challenges. They're there every day to promote what they're working on and uh, that people should work on it and so on. So the organization part of it is kind of the third critical point. Yeah, I did find in writing the book and interviewing the top analytical leaders that a lot of folks – we're moving in that direction, if, if not uh, there already. In fact, uh, people also put their data developers or BI developers into the business units as well. And sometimes that was a de facto reality that the business right. units had hired their own BI developers or someone, some business user had kind of learned the tools on its own and became the go-to person for BI development. But uh, it, it definitely makes sense uh, to do this. And I think it's a great story of yours that uh, you're probably the only manager I know that's willingly given up all his headcount or nearly okay. all of it. Uh, you just don't see that in, in the corporate world too often. So let's there go is to, a little uh, bit of – I was just going to say, uh, if I can take 60 more seconds, there's a little bit of a backstory there too that really what happened was – um, they kept asking, the different groups kept saying, can I have another analyst and another one and another one? And finally, uh, our CFO said, you know, I just can't give you that budget. You know what, if they want them so much, this is how it came about, they make them pay for it. And then, uh, then I thought, well, if they're going to pay for it, you know, we're going to lose all the analysts. So the, the quick story was I had I'd been given headcount to hire six more in – it was probably uh, a quarter or something like that. Um, and he said – the CFO said – you have zero headcount now. You can't hire anybody else. If they want them, they've got to allocate headcount. So I went kind of hat in hand to all these different groups and said, I'm sorry, I actually don't have any headcount. They've changed policies here. I have no headcount. If you're going to want somebody, you're going to have to dedicate one of your what was otherwise scheduled to be an engineering or marketing headcount to an analyst. I had six. I went down to zero. By the time I was done doing my rounds with hat in hand, uh, eight people had signed up. So we went from six to zero, then all the way up to eight. So we ended up with more than I'd even had initially. So it worked out pretty well. So the people, the business unit heads really valued those analysts enough to want to pay for them themselves. And and the thing that I said was, look, you already have 22 engineers or whatever the number was and zero analysts. Are you going to be better off with 23 engineers and zero analysts or 22 engineers and one analyst? Uh, you know, the, going from zero analytic capabilities to at least some. Uh, and most people said, yeah, I think incrementally one engineer will have less impact than one analyst. 
going from zero to one is a lot bigger than a lot bigger impact than going from 22 to 23. All right. All right. Let's move on to our last slide and question here. Um, uh, well, and we've touched on this as well. Uh, what skills must an analyst have to succeed? Yeah, okay. I think there's really three areas, and they're essentially these three points. But when I interview, um, my interview has three different parts of it, and uh, basically aligned with the bullet points you see here. The, the first one is they've got to have some analytical skills, definitely, and they've got to be pretty good at it. So the first series of questions are, Tell me about the most sophisticated uh, analysis you have done. Because, not, again, not that they always have to do sophisticated analyses, but I want to know what kind of skill sets they are bringing to the table. And we'll talk about the analysis and what it was about and what techniques they used and, and so on. And I will always ask them when I start. Um, and I want you to focus on the one that had the biggest impact. Um, so we'll talk about that. Then the, the second portion of the interview is asking them about uh, something about business. I want to make sure they have business savvy. So I would usually ask them to say, explain your business model of your current company. How does it work? And what are the big challenges? What's going on in the industry with your business? I want to make sure that they can talk to me about how the current, the company they're currently working for or previously worked for, how the business worked. And did they have a good grasp of it? Can they explain it to me? Um, so that's how I get a sense of, do they have some business savvy? That they really understand how the business works, where the money comes from. I'll say, you know, how are you getting your customers? What's been most effective? Um, how, how do you guys compete? That kind of stuff. Uh, and then the last one is I want to make sure that they have leadership skills. So the ability to communicate and influence the business, you know, I talk about that as marketing and sales skills. So it's kind of hard uh, to, to test that directly in an interview, but what I have found works as a really good proxy is what I'm really looking for is leadership skills. You've got to get people defining leadership, by the way, as uh, 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 providing incentive for people to change or providing reason and, and, uh, and motivation for people to change behaviors, so doing something that they would not have otherwise done uh, had it not been for your leadership. So I just simply ask, can you give me an example of where you've shown leadership? And it doesn't have to be in business. Uh, it can be from their personal life, uh, you know, something in their community. It can be in their professional life. Uh, and you get people who, you know, I started a uh, little league in my town and I just thought it was important. I went, ahead, went out and did it and I went and spoke to the city council. We raised some funds for it. I think that's a great example of leadership, that somebody's able to make something happen. So those are the skills I look for, technical skills, business savvy, and then leadership skills. And without the leadership skills, uh, I think the other two tend to be far, far less effective because they, that's how you get impact. That's how you make things happen is with your leadership skills. So, Ken, I started a Little League lacrosse program here in town. Does that mean I can come work for Facebook? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I have to ask All you right, about, right. Uh, you know, your baseline technical skills, too. So we'll do that uh, offline, though. All right. Uh, that's fair. Well, let me follow up on this uh, uh, on these types of people you're looking for? Because I know it's a very common question. Uh, people always ask, where can I find these analysts? Where can I find people who are going to you know, help my team succeed? Are there any particular titles that you look for or people who have had specific roles in their companies other than yeah. statisticians or, or business analysts in the past? Yeah, I mean, I look for somebody who um, – for anyone who is very, very comfortable working – with data. So they don't have to be analysts. Um, I'm looking for somebody who has been in a business role and that worked with data. So PMs in technical companies have made some great analysts for me. Um, even at, at PMs Vinda, product, product, product managers, managers, sorry, yes. Product, product marketing managers, managers yeah. or, or product managers. Um, or somebody who's got an engineering degree uh, or some kind of science degree. And I'll give a specific example. The guy who headed up the, all the analysts, who reported to me and headed up all the analysts, I had some analytics uh, analysts, I also had some engineers working uh, for me at, at Zynga. The guy who headed up the analyst team, his background was he had a PhD in economics um, and then worked at uh, uh, essentially Reuters for a while, doing you know a, a little bit of business analysis there. But uh, really focusing on economics, but obviously someone who's got a PhD in economics has done lots of modeling and so on. So 
he turned out to just be fantastic. He really understood business as well, and he understood the Zynga business quite well and was able to really guide the team about here are some high-value things to look at, Here's uh, and here are things that I think we should probably save for another day. So uh, I don't think you- – I don't think that uh, – uh, I just I want to say one more thing, though. It is getting increasingly hard to find these people because I think uh, in the last two or three years, most companies have realized that uh, th- that analyst evangelists can really add a lot more value than someone who can just, you know, run a report for you. So the uh, tact I'm taking at Facebook right now is if we can't find them, we have to make them. And we're working on a two-week immersive embedded class now where the first week is on technical skills and the second week is on business skills, even things like how to present, um, you know, how to make a compelling argument and how to identify the opportunities that will have the biggest impact. So we're going to be training our own if we can't find enough to meet our needs. Oh, that's interesting. That, that, that's a new one for me. Now, do you make a distinction between statisticians and then – Business analysts, are they, uh, they, in your team, do you have two separate teams for each group, or do they kind of mix together, or are they supposed to have all the same skills? Uh, They're they're more mixed together. I do have two types of analysts in my current group. We've got uh, business analysts and then what we call analytic engineers. And both of them have to have the skills that we had on the slide here about uh, business skills and leadership skills as well as technical skills. The only difference there is some of these analytic engineers have a lot more technical skills than the business analysts. So the business analysts uh, can answer you know, majority of business questions that we want to focus on. But uh, there are some things that do take deeper technical skills, like I really need to build a very sophisticated model in R or in SAS, um, or I need to pull stuff out of Hadoop and massage it in a really unique way, uh, which means I've got to go code in Python or in Java or whatever it means. So uh, because they've got an additional skill set, they go more, they go deeper in the technical skills they have a slightly different title, which is uh, an analytics engineer. So, so are they on separate teams or the same team? No, they're, they're I, all on the same team. Of, it's all the same team. There's a lot of companies. They're all on the same team. Yeah, because a lot of companies manage their statisticians separately. They put them in a separate group, usually centralize no. them. Where with the business analysts, they tend to embed them. And even in, even when they're embedded, uh, they're, so if we've got people working on the uh, photos product within Facebook, so you know photos is a huge part of how people interact with Facebook, and there's a team that focuses on optimizing that, and we've got analysts embedded in there. One of them is an analytic engineer, and the other one is a business analyst. I mean, in a way, you can kind of think of it, I, I don't like this characterization, but just to make it uh, a bit simpler to understand. It's more like um, an analyst and then a senior analyst, where they've got even more technical skills. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the uh, maturity model uh, slide here, and I want to have you position Facebook in this model, which has four dimensions uh, on the bottom: its scale and scope, all the way from departmental to uh, intra-enterprise, inter-enterprise. Excuse me. Uh, on the left-hand side is your analytical maturity, going from reporting all the way up to uh, modeling. Uh, on the top, it's data maturity uh, in terms of how consolidated and integrated your information is. Uh, and you know, once you have delivered an enterprise data warehouse, uh, have you taken the next step to incorporate a big data ecosystem that goes beyond structured data? Uh, and on the right-hand side, how sophisticated is your analytical culture? Is, is analytics a strategic resource, uh, or is it a cost center? So I'm wondering where you would place uh, Facebook in this uh, this model right now today, and then we'll ask yeah. you where you uh, think it might be in 18 months. I think today we're, we actually do – I mean, if you look at some of the categorizations you've got on the uh, horizontal and vertical axes – I think it would be pretty fair to put us somewhere in the upper right box, but definitely not in the upper right of the upper right box. I think either closer to the middle of the box or maybe even um, a little bit towards uh, somewhere between the middle and the lower left-hand corner of that quadrant. 
I, I think we definitely are doing lots of proactive work, and we've done even more of that in the last year than ever before. Um, and I think we we have a consolidated data repository. I don't know if you want to call Hadoop a data warehouse, but one one unified data system that everybody is accessing. So we've got all that worked out. Uh, we've made a ton of progress in figuring out what tables are kind of core to the business that need to be curated, as you were saying before, versus which ones, you know, a different group created them, they can manage them. I don't even really need to know about it. Uh, that's part of the culture here of allowing people to move quickly, that if there's something you want to do and it's just for your group, go ahead and do it. Don't even, you know, don't even worry about whether or not I think it's okay, because uh, I, I will think it's okay. Um, it's only when it, uh, it has to be coordinated across multiple areas of the company that that uh, my team really needs to get involved in in approving things like that. In in terms of All what right. will make us go to the upper right, is that the second part of the question? Well, the second part is I I, I tried to use this uh, um, online cursor here to show where you are today. I kind of muffed it up, but uh, the second part <laughs> of the question is where will you be in 18 months? Yeah, well, of course, the goal for everyone, and and where I'm setting the goal for my team is the you know upper um, upper uh, rightmost corner um, is where we'd love to be. And I the the main things we're working on right now um, along those lines are a little more putting a little more. Uh, there's there's two things. One is tactical, and one is strategic. From the tactical things, putting a little more of this. Uh, curation in place so that everyone is looking at the same data. One of the risks of allowing anybody to do whatever they want in their corner of the database is that they may do something a little bit different than somebody else and trust their own answers, uh, which will be different from other people's answers, and then you get confusion there, which is pretty common, uh, I mean, across all companies, not just Facebook. So now we have this concept of whether the data is certified or not, and we've created a centralized portal that if you get data from this centralized portal, and it's data from all across the company, whether it's finance or international or different product areas or whatever it may be, if you get data from that portal, it is certified. It is trusted. If you get data not in that portal, it's essentially swim at your own risk. You can base decisions off that data if you want, but uh, no one has looked at that and validated that it is, in fact, accurate. So we're doing more and more of that. That's the tactical part. The strategic part is if you look at all the data we've got and all the different ways it could be used to give users a better experience uh, and help them be more connected with their friends and create more revenue opportunities out of that, uh, I think we're just scratching the surface there. We're using it for ads right now. We're using it for recommending friends to you, which helps with engagement a ton. We're using it in the third major area we're using the data is using everything we know about you and your friends to try and pick out of the flood of information that your friends are posting, which will be most relevant to you. So those are three things we're doing right now, but I think there's literally dozens of things we could be doing and will be doing um, to make the experience even better and more personalized and more relevant for you. So we're not quite using this strategic asset we have as well as we could. So those are the things that we want to focus on as well. And that'll put us in the upper right-hand corner. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, it, it sounds like you've done a lot already since you've been there, which has only been a couple of months, and you got big plans, and uh, we expect to hear some great things in a year from now. Well, well great. Um, I, I hope so as well. <laughs> so at this point, uh, I know I see a lot of questions that have come in over the transom here. Why don't I turn this uh, over to Eric, and we can field some questions from the audience. Okay, great, and uh, great presentation, guys. A lot of good content there. I, I tweeted a whole bunch of those concepts. I like that analyst evangelist concept. and it, it really does speak to the importance of being able to communicate to people and to get someone to change something. Because if they don't change something, then, you know, then what has really transpired? Obviously not much. So here we have a number of good questions. And Ken, you kind of talked to a couple of these already, but maybe just dig into a bit of detail. One of the attendees asks, what or how do you measure impact as suggested? Is it KPIs, earned value, what, which, which gets deference? Right. Um, there's, there's two ways, uh, and one is a uh, explicit, the me not measurable, explicit identifiable, I mean to say, change in behavior either internally or externally. And it can be, hey, we um, used to focus on 
getting you more and more and more friends. Now we're focused on, hey, once you've got 15 friends, that's plenty, figuring out how to get you to interact with the ones you've already got. That is an explicit, identifiable change in behavior that the product teams would say, yes, that's true, we've changed our behaviors. So that's, that's one. The other ones are just any metric that you feel is important to the, con uh, the, the company, is uh, those are much easier to track. If it's number of registrations per week, if it's um, you know, an engagement level, which is number of days per week a user visits, if it's revenue generated per unit time, if it's whatever it is, uh, yeah, the, you can have a, we want to have a 5% increase in a particular metric or an identifiable change in behavior. And by the way, behavior can also be customer behavior, where they used to spend uh, only 10% of their time on photos. I'm making these numbers up. Uh, we want to get that to be about 25% of their time. Did we do it? So, um, you know, it's changing their behavior of how they interact with the site. That's interesting. Okay, good. And uh, here's just a kind of a little humorous question. Do you measure the impact of BI in BI? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually not humorous. We absolutely do. And it's, you know, we call those our meta reports um, where we look at the overall impact we've had as a group because at the end of every quarter, um, uh, it's not one of our most – refined dashboards because it's only for ourselves to use. But uh, we look at the aggregate impact because at the end of each quarter, we do two things. We uh, not only figure out and discuss what we're going to be doing next quarter and figuring out what are our measurable goals for next quarter. Uh, and we use this, uh, I won't get into it now, but you can use Wikipedia. It'll give you everything you know about it. We call them SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T, for uh, specific, uh, measurable, aggressive, although people have different definitions of what A is, uh, results-oriented and time-bounded. So we want to make sure that every goal we come up with is absolutely measurable. Um, but uh, we put that in a dashboard to figure out how we've done. So at the end of each quarter, we define what our SMART goals are going to be for, you know, right now we're doing it for Q4, and what was the impact of all the goals that we set out for in Q3. And if, if we can, we try and tie that as much as possible to more users, more engagement for Facebook, and additional revenue. So, and we, we run reports for that. So, yes, we do. Okay, good. And here's a really good question, and, and Wayne even kind of asked this one. Um, I'll, I'll read what the attendee writes real quick. It says, uh, do you think it's possible to split the roles, a strong analytics person teamed up with a strong business analyst, or must a single person possess these combined skills, and I'm guessing it's a combination of both, right? Yeah, um, I think it can work, and that's something we've talked about internally, too, predominantly driven by the fact that it's getting harder and harder to find someone who's got both skills. Um, so one of the things I want to experiment with, and we haven't tried this yet, so I have no idea if it'll work, but um, what I w would like to do is take some of the analysts who may not have the super strong business skills and give them you know, a week or so of just basic background business skills training, and then conversely, pair them up with someone who's like a product manager who may not have super strong technical skills, get them to be more savvy about technology. So now you've got these two people, one person who's, uh, who can work together, and since they're embedded in the same group, they can sit next to each other. And I, I have some strong belief that that will work. Uh, but we haven't tried it yet, so I don't have any evidence. But basically, you have an analyst who's got some business background working with a business person who's got some analytics background. And they both have their strengths and can and have enough of the information that they can talk to the other person in the language that the other person is strong in. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Here's another Yeah, I've question. heard a couple of uh, – I, I know Nokia uh, creates um, teams of people uh, – to fulfill the role of uh, a data scientist, uh, which they're keen to uh, yep. have in, in house, and sometimes they'll put together SWAT teams of three or four people to create that one role. And then uh, a, a little bit of a twist on that: I know Kelly Blue Book um, on their statistical team, they'll put um, new statisticians and they'll team them up with the um, with business people who they're supporting, but business people who have uh, worked with statisticians in the past and, and know how the process works. Right. Uh, conversely, they'll take an experienced statistician and, and pair them up with uh, a business sponsor who doesn't have much experience working with statisticians so that, um, so yeah. that these two people uh, can, can dance I, together without uh, tripping on each other's feet, so to speak. 
I think what will be required is I don't think it would work if you took someone who's a professor of statistics but doesn't have much business background and isn't really interested in it and combine them with, you know, someone who's got a, an MBA but doesn't really have that much analytic background. They have to know enough about and have enough appreciation for what the other person does so that they can work with them. You can't just take two people who excel in one area but have no visibility in what really happens in the other part of the world. And so you can get this yin and yang combination between two people, I think that could work, but they have to have a, a reasonable understanding and appreciation of uh, the other half. Right. Okay, good. Here's a, a few more good questions here, so we'll try to motor through them. One of the attendees writes, it seems like one of the best areas to get business value from data is to use financial data, but that's often locked down by CFOs and accounting processes. Um, how successful have you been either here or in, in past experiences at being able to integrate financial data with other kinds of data into some kind of an analytics program? Uh, yeah, it, I agree. It's very challenging. And in fact, um, for, you know, for public companies, in many times you really are almost prohibited from doing it unless you've got very tight controls over it for, uh, for Sarbanes-Oxley reasons. Uh, and at Zynga, you know, we had our data warehouse really had very little financial information in it because of that. Um, that was intentional. So, so I would say that I agree that there's a lot of richness in things you may be able to find in uh, financial data. Uh, but what I would say is, given the, the kind of legal complexities of that, I have spent most of my last five years focusing on how to get value out of predominantly non-financial data. Um, and and whenever we do have financial data, it was more aggregated. So we never had financial data about this user spent this much. It would be this category of user, you know, spent this much. So we would have things aggregated and rolled up so we didn't uh, cross any boundaries that we shouldn't cross with, with uh, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. But uh, I would just say that though it seems like there's an easy lure of financials, I would do everything you can to get financial information into your warehouse as much as you can without – breaking any rules, but uh, once you once you hit a wall, just you, I guarantee there's tons of other hidden gems in there that will keep you busy for years uh, that's non-financial. Right. That's very interesting. I remember one of the critiques of the whole Enron debacle was that uh, there were certain bonuses tied to stock prices, and I think that's what you're alluding to with, uh, with Starbucks right. Oxley, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's very interesting. And also, if you put financial information in there, then everyone who plays around with the data warehouse at all now becomes an insider, uh, which means, you know, it's a huge portion of Facebook and Zynga or people looking around because you want everybody to be able to look at the data that's driving the company, but you don't want everybody to become an insider suddenly. So lots of reasons. But there's plenty of other good stuff in there, uh, even outside of finances. Right. That's very interesting. And I'm guessing that, you know, you work with your senior management team to come up with goals and then you turn around and work with the analysts and, and those folks. And one of the questions that came in too, it's a good one, is in that model you discussed, which I think is, is frankly brilliant of having the different divisions pick up the tab for the analysts. Let's say an organization does that. How do you then as the lead analyst, if you will, or the manager of those people remain the person who guides their efforts or does that become a bit tenuous? Well, as I said, there is there is a little bit of conflict there, but um, it really comes down to uh, evangelizing again, because what happens is they say, you know, I don't even want to reporting to you, Ken. I, I want to, since I'm paying for them, they should be reporting to me. <laughs> then this this is where I have to see if I can be a good evangelist and salesperson and marketing person, saying you're going to get more value out of that person being part of a group that can provide support, additional skills, additional resources, and so on. They will be a better analyst for your group and provide more value to the company overall as well if they are still part of this central organization because if they're part of an engineering team or a product management team, there's really nobody watching out for how do you increase your analytic skills. Um, so, uh, you know, I said having a centralized analytics team is required to really be able to uh, – have a strong impact throughout the company, have a real voice that can be heard and get things done and have some momentum. And if they start uh, saying, well, you know, I want to just have them in my team and not part of your group anymore, then they lose all that. So you have to have that discussion. Uh, but I think I've been lucky so far or, or 
I don't know, uh, good enough at, at evangelizing that I've been able to convince people that they need to remain part of a central organization, that it will actually benefit them in the end. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, Wayne, let's do our uh, our key takeaways here. I, I put that slide up in front of us, and maybe you just want to talk to uh, what struck you. I know some of these uh, points that Ken made about you know, going around and, and basically, you know, handing over power is a very bold thing to do, and you know, I think it pays dividends. But what do you think? No, absolutely, and, and, and Ken's done a wonderful job of just summarizing the, these uh, these key points in, in terms of a, a easy to remember mantra. So his first one was, and probably the most important, was focus on impacts. Not insights, and and even to the point where you want to incent your analysts for the impact uh, of their insights, and make them responsible for that. Uh, right. The second focus on questions more than answers. Uh, I love that because to me it's about um, uh, kind of investigating what are the hidden assumptions that drive your business, and surfacing those, and then uh, testing them with with data and seeing if they actually do correlate with reality. Uh, the third was be an evangelist, uh, not an oracle, uh, and that means you need analysts who are great persuaders who can get in there, roll up their sleeves, and say, hey, you guys need to adopt this insight and make it happen. It also means that they need to be embedded into the teams that they're supporting and be part of those teams and be seen by the business as key contributors, not just an outsider. And then finally, to be an effective analyst, I think uh, Ken made a great case that they need to be as much salespeople uh, as as analysts, and, and they need to have those skills, um, sales skills, and have business knowledge as well as the, the core analytical skills. So uh, I know a lot. I Ken, you've done a lot of speaking uh, at uh, Silicon Valley companies uh, uh, to their analyst teams, and I think uh, every time you go in. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air because uh, there's a whole new way of looking at the analyst function in organizations. So I, I think these these insights have been well received, um, and I'm, I'm wondering if there are, there are any other nuances that you want to talk about before we uh, leave our audience today. No, I, I think you've really summarized it, and it it comes down to the fact that these are things that you know I, I try and, and I urge everyone to think deeply about what can analytics really be for a company. Uh, and think outside the box. And I think uh, uh, a lot of these ideas I've been the champion of, not all of them have, have come from me, certainly. So just empower the analyst to, to make changes in the company and make sure they don't feel that their job is to just generate reports for people, that their job is to really figure out how to improve the business and then making sure that that happens. That's really the summary of it. And I just constantly try and take a step back with some people who I also think have really good insights into this and say, what can we do even more? What can we, how can we do even more? And so that's really it. I think this is, you've summarized it quite well. Yeah, and I'm guessing. Yeah, and I think if you had to summarize the summarization, it would be you know just don't be content to be order takers, but to be proactive right. business people. Right. So, right. You know, I'm guessing one of the key skills to have as one of those analyst evangelists, and this is why one reason why it's hard to find is you need someone with a strong enough ego to be bold enough to say things that could cause disruption, but also have that sense of humility such that they don't simply upset people when they say these disruptive things, right? Right, right. Yeah, I have to think that's probably a, a pretty rare person, but I think we are seeing this movement toward IT better understanding the business and business better understanding IT, just as the whole community becomes more educated about how these technologies work. And, and Wayne, there's one more question I'll throw over to you. One of the attendees, uh, uh, is it a small uh, nonprofit and has been brought in to be the an analyst and knows that he needs to be the evangelist uh, and is wondering which tools to use, and gosh, there are lots of them out there. Uh, certainly one of them uh, provided by Tableau Software. But any advice to uh, someone out there who is trying to do all this stuff by themselves beyond what we've talked about already? <laughs> well, that's an easy question in many ways. I, I had 20 chapters in my book, <laughs> and each chapter, each chapter was based on a question that I commonly get asked about analytics. And so one of them is this question, you know, what tools should I use? And, you know, I've spent my life analyzing uh, uh, different tools from different vendors and writing reports and things like that. But when you go out to people like Ken, 
and people of his caliber running analytics programs, they don't really talk about the tools at all because they can use almost any tool out there and, and, and make it happen. And, and you didn't hear Ken today talk about tools or technology. Uh, rather, it's the approach uh, that you use to uh, asking the right questions and, and delivering the right answers that's most important. Now, that being said, there are some tools that are more powerful than others, and I'm not going to say name. It's, it's hard to name names, but I think what we're seeing is that the technology keeps advancing at, at a very rapid rate uh, so that it actually does behoove you to um, access and implement some of the more um, recent uh, technologies and tools that have come onto the market in the last five years with you know, with in memory and parallel processing, columnar databases, visualization, uh, there's just a hell of a lot more that we can do now uh, than we be, uh, used to be able to. So uh, the tools and the technologies are the least important thing in delivering great analytic, uh, analytics and, and running a successful analytics programs, uh, but there's no sense in depriving yourself of the latest tools and technologies if you can get access to them. Yeah, and Ken, one of the um uh, attendees wanted to know the technology behind the portal. Can you share that, the portal that you talked about earlier that's the trusted set of data? It's uh, very simple stuff. We had uh, It's homegrown, uh, and literally it, the first version of it was written by one guy in about two weeks. Um, so all it really does is it's a, a series of – because we had um, – so you know, it's basically just some handwritten code you, that that just does some graphics on the screen. It's got a panel on the left for navigation of you know folders that you can then drill into, and you click on it, and it displays the results of the report in the rest of the the right hand of the screen. And really, all it all it needed to do initially in its first iteration is we've got some reports in Tableau, we've got some reports in MicroStrategy, we've got some reports in an internal visualization tool that was built years ago. Uh, and, and on and on, and really all it needed to do was just have a link to those things. So you can go to one place. You don't need to remember the URLs or what repositories they're in. Just go to one place and click on the report name, and wherever it is, the results will come back in the right part of the screen. So it was just something we decided to build very quickly. Again, it, you know, we could have gotten fancy and evaluated tools, but we just wanted something clean and simple, and we just wrote something very quickly. One guy, two weeks. Yeah, and I, I will say that's a really wonderful anecdote right there because, Wayne, I'm guessing you'll agree that, yes, there are great tools everywhere, but sometimes building your own stuff is the way to go. And if you look at some of the most prominent organizations, the biggest companies in the world, a lot of what they use is homegrown, right? Well, at, at Zynga, Ken, Ken will tell you that uh, they didn't have money to buy tools, so I think all they <laughs> used was open source, right? And then the yeah. first tool they bought was uh, – and, yeah. and initially, and then we eventually bought uh, Zynga uses Vertica and then Tableau, but uh, tons of other stuff and all that other stuff is is generally open source that we sometimes hacked up a bit, but generally it was free open source stuff. And Facebook is very similar too. Wow, that's great stuff. Well, folks, uh, let me push a slide about our next event coming up here. It's going to be fairly soon, I believe. Yes, yeah, September 24th with Eric Colson, former director of analytics at Netflix. Kudos to Wayne for getting these folks to do these events. Huge thank you to Ken Rudin, director of analytics over at Facebook. Um, wonderful stuff. These are all great ideas. I think you're going to provide a lot of value there. The analyst evangelist, that's great stuff. And I like this whole concept of if we can't find them, we'll make them. <laughs> right, Just right. Get it done somehow. Well, big right. thank you once again to our sponsor as well, Tableau Software. They have a user conference coming up November 5th to the 8th, and I hear that Malcolm Gladwell is going to be the keynote or so. Talk about a, a visionary, a luminary. He's one of the more compelling figures of our time. And with that, folks, we will end this event. I will tell you that we will archive this. You can come back to InsideAnalysis.com or BiLeadership.com shortly after we conclude to check out the archive and share it with your colleagues. So thanks again, folks. We hope to catch up with you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.